Hello, Tile friends. Welcome back to another episode of Tile Money. I am Luke Miller, your host, and this is the podcast where I discuss the business of tile installation. Today, I have an interview with Robert Davis out of Oregon. Robert, how are you today? I'm fantastic. How are you doing today, Luke? Doing good. Thank you. Looks like you're in your work van. Thank you for taking I am in my work van. Yes, I just got up off my knees just shortly, a little bit ago. Right on. Yeah. So this work- is also my office. I have, uh, oh, you can see down here, I got the, uh, it's a uh, Duluth Trading Company duffel kind of zip file organizer yep. and it has really helped me i mean the it's pretty basic i have a folder for fuel and vehicle expenses and a folder for meals and a folder for building materials basically and i just stuff paper receipts in there and give it to the, the tax person at the end of the year anyway so yeah it's my office so does it look like it has more more natural life than mine though <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm working from home today. Um, <laughs> but I keep I, I do the same thing you do. Uh, I actually, I actually made a, a leather briefcase for myself. Nice. And I keep I keep every job that we have going um, with its own folder. And oh, I, that's a good plan. And then once it's once it's complete after grout and sealer, I, I take it out and put it in the, the big folder. Completed. Okay. Uh, file the file cabinet. There you go. <laughs> nice. A vast part of the paperwork and specification type things like you're talking about keeping organized is digital for me. Um, mm. uh, almost all of my work is for builders in this area. Um, it's I really like it that way. It makes it to where I don't have to do a lot of demolition. I don't have to wrangle drywall guys. Um, I know a lot of guys are doing full bathroom models and they probably have some skills that I don't have. Um, but yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> hey, uh, before we get too far into the interview, let's um, let's go backwards here. And uh, I always like to ask my guests what kind of fun activities or hobbies they have after work. Well, I'm a father of two, and so I have a lot of time wrapped up. It's my favorite thing is to hang out with my family. It's really cool to see. I have a, a one year old and a four year old daughter. She'll be five a couple of days after Christmas. Okay. And being being part of that is just a it's a tremendous blessing, and it's just a a constant source of amazement to me that sure. this that this could even be happening. You know, it's just I'm pleasantly surprised by my life most days when I get home and you hear little voices scream "Daddy" and thunder thunder towards the door. Um, aside from family life, um, I do uh, I have a degree in audio engineering, and so I spend a good bit of time with some local bands. I run sound and um, the front of house engineer and system technician for uh, smaller bands in the area that play different gigs and stuff so i don't really make very much money from it but it's part of just being involved with uh, other like-minded folks it's its, its own reward okay. i play music as well but i don't have very much time for that anymore I, I also run sound for my church a good bit of the time so uh there's just not a lot of time to actually get my hands on a guitar i have a guitar hanging on my wall in my living room and it's been hanging there i've dusted every six months or so but other than <laughs> that it doesn't get played very much so yeah 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 but um, soon, my five-year-old, we just moved our, uh, our grandmother's piano into our home. So I'm looking forward oh. to, to teaching her a little bit about that. She already knows all the notes. <laughs> okay. All, what all the white and the black keys, she knows all the names of them. So Nice. Yeah. So That'll be fun. enthusiastic about that. And so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. yeah. That's, a new, that's a new milestone in, in her life. That's awesome. Definitely. Yeah. Nice. Right on. Well, that that sounds good. It sounds like you're a busy uh, average tile contractor. What is your what does your business yeah. look like? How many employees? And how long have you been in business? Um, I am currently running one employee. His name's Eric. He's an apprentice. He's in his third year with me, and unfortunately, he has joined the Air Force and is shipping out January first. So he's in uh, the last couple of weeks here with me, but he's in there in the house. I'm sitting in front of set and tile right now. Uh, he's doing a really good job. I've had you know, pretty few complaints over the last several years about about things. I mean, we all learn from breaking things generally, you know, but uh, yeah, and I'm transitioning. I interviewed another setter yesterday that I'm going to be bringing on as contract laborer and paying him hourly for the first quarter of the next year to uh, work with me and see if it's a good long-term fit, if uh, he might want to come on as an employee and be on payroll. So kind of bouncing around uh when when i first started my business of course it was just me and uh i really quickly found that i would could need some help and 
a full-time employee situation kind of got thrust on me a little earlier than I had planned. And so it hasn't been the most profitable thing over time. Um, you know, from training people, surely that one person with a brand new green trainee goes much slower than one person without that trainee. So <clears throat> my pricing strategy with working at, uh, with an employee had been that eventually he needs to make me uh, half again as fast by being on site or he needs to produce half as much as I'm capable of producing for this to pencil out because then I can just bid everything as if I'll be doing it myself. It costs half as much to have him on site. So if he ups my production by 50%, that pencils out at the end of the job and it made sense to have him there, or at least it wasn't a bad thing. Right. So it was a bad thing, obviously, for like the first year and a half. And there have been some expensive mistakes, granite related expenses, um, different things getting broken that made it even less uh, financially reasonable to have that situation. But we're just okay. getting to where it was going to, you know, he, he's in there setting tile. He could do it without me, you know. Um, was he fortunate that he's leaving? But yeah, yeah, we always hate to see our helpers go. Was he completely a greenhorn when you, when you first hired him? Stone cold, what are these little lines on the tape measure? Nothing, <laughs> nothing, man. He was the uh, the worship leader at our church, actually. And oh. he was initially started out um, just coming and grouting for me around the holidays um, in 15, 14 or 15, 2014, 15, anyway, somewhere around there. And uh, just decided that he wanted to make more money than he was making working for the church. So, yeah. It, yeah. So. So after, so that's pretty good. It, it seems like three years. I mean, that sounds about right. Sounds, sounds like a good, he, he took, he took it and he, uh, he ran with it and he was able to get the hang of it. Cause now he's installing some tile by himself. And so yep. you'd say he's, he's at the point where he's increasing your, your time by 50%. Your yeah. Um, as far as actual hours on site where I find that the efficiency gets lost is that when you have someone that doesn't have a wide breadth of experience in the trade and they haven't seen the same issues that need solved repeatedly, you know, there are going to be some, some, uh, some poor decisions that happen. And so to remedy that costing me a ton of time and money and re maybe replacing tile and, and different things, um, I have made it my habit to be first thing at the day I make sure I'm here and he has everything that he needs if we're not going to be working at the same site which and then come at the end of the day and make sure that you know that basically our motto is we fix things with trowels not hammers you know uh, it's, I can fix almost anything at the end of the day but the next morning it's a little bit harder a little more gotcha. problematic so yeah. that has cost me some a good bit of money um, our my the builders that I work for work around the Willamette Valley here in Oregon and so some jobs are in Salem some jobs are in Albany Lebanon and Corvallis and basically that uh, makes a big triangle on the I-5 corridor so some days I spend three and a half four hours driving two jobs and back and forth to make sure that at the end of the day we're not going to be breaking stuff in the morning to fix it so that is an unexpected cost of doing business that I had not figured into a lot of the jobs that I'm working on right now. And I feel like if I had just realized that was a necessity, I would have been planning for it and charging for it, you know, maybe more uh, over the course of the last year. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause you're, it sounds like you're running basically like two jobs at once, pretty much all the time. You get almost always two jobs at once. Um, I try and overlap them so that um, I can be, wet shimming or what what have you doing prep on one job right while he's grouting out the other job or trimming out niches one person one person tasks yep. Uh, yep. and then when uh, we're in the hay making where it's a bigger floor or a big shower where um, I can either have him running cuts and just supplying me feeding me or he can actually be setting tile that's when it's golden and you're thinking, wow, we made some money today. <laughs> we're gonna lose it all Friday, but we made some money today, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's a pretty good system. I like that. Yep. Sounds like it's a well-oiled machine. So Yeah. And the next step in the machine, obviously, is um, having the not having to not have to make all those trips to job sites to verify, you know, outcomes. Uh, and that was probably just a few months out. We, I was, uh, I've got a truck that I'm fixing up. I was going to put them in and give them a fuel card. And it's just the next process in maturing into being a, a tile setter. Yep. Um, and 
So this uh, this gentleman that I interviewed yesterday is it's it's like uh, we were discussing earlier. It's, he's basically a unicorn. Here's an established tile setter. He's a CTI. Uh, he's been in the trade for 20 years. It's the only thing he's ever really done, and he doesn't want to run his own business really hard. Uh, he just moved to this area and was recommended to me by um, tile folks that I respect: Dirk Sullivan, Sean Parker up in Portland. Um, you know, and a lot of reps, even folks right. who didn't get along with him all say, yeah, he's a good tile guy. I can, I can put up with almost anything for a good tile guy right yeah, now, you know? Sure. So it, it's interesting that Eric is like exiting right about the point where this other fella is coming in and will be stepping in, in, into the process where I had expected to be with Eric. So I'm hoping that it will be relatively hiccup free. You know, yeah. I've got high hopes. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm excited for you. Uh, I'm, Thanks. I'm looking forward to seeing how it all works out. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. sounds, it sounds good. It sounds very promising. So, and that's been, that's been one of the, the ongoing themes, um, the struggles for tile contractors right now. And I mean, any trade really is, is finding the good help. So. Yep. The drywall guys have the same problems we do. Nobody, yeah. there just aren't a lot of folks out there that want to work hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. So how how so you're working for a lot of builders? Do you want to talk about how you price jobs? Um, we don't have to talk about numbers per se, but how do you come up with you know time or? Well, when I when I first went out on my own, I, of course I had no idea where I sat in the market, and okay. I was pricing things super low. But my basic uh, principle behind it was just time and material, and then mark that up. I had been counseled by folks who had read the um, profit and markup book. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a copy of it now, but basically I was just sit, spending a ton of time penciling out on a, you know, on a notepad and write how many sheets of backer board I needed and how many bags of mud and on and on, pardon me, like that. Um, and pretty rapidly I found that it penciled out to be very close as far as the balance between setting materials and labor, uh, that the, those numbers were very similar once you packaged it all into one. So uh, over the course of the last several years, I've developed a system where when I bid a job, um, I have a standard shower prep price. Or, well, this was, this was the first step in the process getting to where I am now was saying, okay, it, it cost me $1,750 to prep a three by five shower. Whether it's weedy, whether I have to mud it, whatever, you know, we'll trade time for money with manufacturers and, and hopefully speed up the process. Um, but then I was, so then I would, the same sheet of paper, you know, but just starting with faster numbers, trying to find ways uh, to find efficiency in the system. So say we're, it's going to cost me $1,700 to prep a three by five shower. Mm -hmm. Now, how many half days is it going to take me to set that and then grout it? Um, and that, then you're just counting bags of thin set for the most part, going off of square footages and figuring. Um, but I haven't really... I had no training in bidding jobs. And so I didn't really look at the uh, going with a square footage type of rate. I see a lot of guys are pricing things that way, but it just doesn't work for me. There's so much intricacy where, you know, there's there's five square feet of tile in that shower in there right now that's gonna take a full day to, to fart around with. And right. that, that sort of thing cannot be accommodated with a, a square foot pricing scheme. So, um, so then, by tracking, which is handy for all of us, you need to be tracking the hours. How many how many feet of tile did you set today? How much driving did you do today? And finding out what, what on average your expenses for that sort of thing are, I found that not only could I just knock out prep basically as a line item, but a standard three by five shower with an accent stripe and a, a custom frame niche because we won't do niches any other way. Um, and, you know, maybe a corner seat. Um, almost always was with, you know, fluctuating around $4,000, $4,500 for the, for the cost before markup. So, um, so that's been my system now is all, all my builders now have a sheet that says your base shower, a three by five curved shower has, um, is going to cost you $3,850 and it's going to have a niche. We don't build showers with niches. I can't remember the last time we built a shower that didn't have a, a niche in it. So that's right. part of the standardized thing. So standard meaning three wall curved to eight feet high so then um 
my bid sheet. You know, of course, it's different for certain contractors because certain they, they aren't as good at certain things. They're not all good at this. Yeah. Know, but I just have a list in my phone, and, and they have this list as well. And any time uh, something costs me money unexpectedly, it gets put on the list. So now they have that list, and they can say, okay, here's what a basic shower costs. But, oh, there are all these things that our customer wants added to that as well. Um, so I've got pattern tile, stone, super format, glass, mosaics, pencil trims, miters, uh, square footage price for uh, above eight feet, any square footage above eight feet, ceilings, steamers, an extra niche, an extra accent, stripe, scribe work, insets, corner shelves, bench or corner seat, a uh, fourth wall, pony wall, window return, header, that's the, that's one that killed me. I had no idea how much time I was going to spend the first time I did a header over a tub spur around. And they were like, well, can you tile that bit up there? Oh, that's <laughs> a couple hundred bucks for that. And wow, that really took me a lot of time. Yeah. Um, window returns, pebbles, polishing, solid surface fabrication. We don't do very much of that. And epoxy grout. Those are the things that are on my list right now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what are you, what are you using to track that list? What is that an app on your, uh, it's, just the, the ink pad okay. on my on my Android phone. It, it's a uh, syncs with Amazon, so that I have access to it on all my devices. Nice. Um, I'm logged in through my email with it. So and uh, then that listed. So as your builders, you said have that same list. As you update that list, theirs gets updated as well. As or I update this list here, this is just my scratch, my scribble pad. Then okay. I generate a new document and send it out to them in, a, in a group email. Okay. Yeah. Nice. yeah. And then that, that really helps them. Um, you know, one of the things that I was asked for pretty early with the builders, especially was not only a pricing sheet like this, but uh, a sheet that helps them understand the costs of getting things ready for tile. So, um, I just stole Dirk Sullivan's because he made it available and sent it along. It's basically, you know, is that is there a flight of stairs? Um, that's an important one. Flight of stairs can kill you, man. Right, right. Um, is there, is it heated? Is it uh, accessible? Is it securable? Are, you know, all, on and on like that, just different questions that the builder can look at before they start uh, scheduling and say, oh, well, this, this line item that is a requirement for us to be ready for Robert to come tile that won't be met until then. So we need to change the way that we're scheduling. Um, something we've run into a lot that has cost me a ton of money in the last year is that the builders are trying to economize the schedule and stack people up as efficiently as possible so that they can get a fast turnaround. All the homeowners, they don't want their bathroom gutted for 16 weeks or whatever. And I appreciate that. But part of condensing the schedule, there's a couple of negative effects that can happen from that one there's going to be problems we're all in this fluid construction you know life and, and things just happen and it, you can't predict it the painter's wife got hit by a drunk driver i mean circumstances beyond your control are going to screw you up and when you're packed in tight like that it can really be a problem yeah um the the recurring problem beyond that that i have run into is that my solid surface for my shower is not ready when I need it to be because to build things properly the way that I like my silicone is always going to face sideways instead of up. Um, I need that granite now. Uh, we're building a shower. I need it here on prep day, man. Right. Uh, so the I've had some pushback, but we have eventually, you know, at, there was a point where I had to say, okay, this is going to cost more. If this continues to happen, that's fine. But I'm just going to charge you an extra five, six hundred bucks on each job because we're pulling off and coming back and setting up saws setting six tiles that land on granite and grouting that little bit and that's a lot of dicking around so you're going to pay a full day's labor for that at yeah. least um and so now we've, we're getting it to a sweet spot when i got to the shower right here there were second, six or seven pieces of quartz uh already fabricated already blanked out sitting there ready for me to install them right. when i yeah so um that yeah that sort of recognizing that sort of cost um uh, has been a, a big help to find just, you know, just like I said, anything that costs you money um, yeah. needs to go on the list. So well, good, good for you for standing your ground to these builders and, and, you know, really, well, you know, communicating is what it boils down to. That's what it is. And uh, a lot of them are my friends. I mean, a couple of them yeah. go to my church. It's a, it's not like, I, I feel like I'm in a very pleasant situation compared to some other guys where I see them posting and there's looks like there's some animosity or some, out to get you kind of attitude and i don't have that in the community that i'm working with um okay 
all my builders know each other they, and respect each other and I don't have a lot of fighting over price. Um, but it's just like, you know, nobody wants to be, you know, when you find out, oh, dang, that thing cost money. Well, if I didn't tell you that it was going to cost money, then I'm eating it. And I just don't want to eat things a bunch of times. You know? Right. So they've, they're, they've been pretty receptive to that. That um, It's just that it upsets their standard balance where they're like, well, we'll just have the cabinet guys in there, you know, right before the tile guys. And, and uh, so changing the way they schedule things was the, the real thing. Nobody likes change. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But in a few months, they'll get used to it. And forget, yeah, forget and it'll be the normal thing. Exactly. And it actually helped because you know the now the sometimes the granite guys are delivering while we're doing, and then we have you know some communication capability with the granite guys, and that make that can make things easier when they see For how sure. things are going, see how things are getting built. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, a, a lot of them are you know, and this isn't necessarily business related, but they're. Uh, it's not a it's not a good practice that they're used to coming into a shower that is completely done tile guys are gone and they're just dropping slab cutting it to fit wherever it goes and then they're they're splitting uh after they run their silicone and it's just not it's not the best way to build a shower it's not you know if it was terrible and bad and it was causing failures left and right then obviously it would be getting addressed by now but it's not the best right and that's what my business model is is the best i found out you know very when i first got into uh, the trades well I, I was a framer growing up so I okay. had a lot of experience in framing I can hand cut roofs and things like that um, in 06 07 aside from being just a total degenerate tweaker um, I there was there was no work going on either and my entire life fell apart and I was broken went to prison and just was a wreck wow um, at the time that that all started getting turned around um, I was just a day laborer helper and they were sending me out to framing sites and you know for this place that I was staying and a, one day a tile guy picked me up his name's Jeremy Von Ruden and uh, we got along really well that day and of course it's efficient for him to not train a new grunt every day so he kept coming back and asking um, for that same guy so over the last 10 years I've done a lot of work for him and with him and he's worked for me on different projects and uh, it was it's just a a really fortunate way for things to work out where um, at that time people were not framing there was no work for framers because nobody was building new construction and right. when you remodel a bathroom generals don't hire a framer to come in and do the little bit of framing that there is to do they do it themselves so I was just unemployable at that point um, so th those same folks that had a little money and were being conservative with it turned to remodeling maybe their own homes uh, in hopes of when the market increased having better sale prices for them. So uh, a lot of the finished trades, tile guys like that just went right from full, you know, new construction and just switched over to a remodeling thing and uh, were able to weather that storm. So it brought me through a, a pretty rough patch. And uh, as I was exposed to more tile, you know, one day uh, um, I came across tile geeks on Facebook and I had not really had any exposure to industry standards or, or no, I had not known that there was like, there are people that write books about tile, you know, <laughs> um, this is a fantastic thing. And to see that very quickly, you know, I thought at that time that I was a pretty good tile guy. And of course I put up work that I was doing and like a lot of young guys on the forums, I got shredded and I was not directional troweling and I was just doing all kinds of stupid stuff and inefficient things and had no idea how these systems were designed to work. Mm -hmm. Um, and so social media turned my perspective on everything around because it right about that time I was starting to think I should go back to framing the market was picking up and I thought I could go run a framing crew and make a lot more money than I'm making right now interesting but then I saw that this is not not only is this a, a real like it's a legit thing like we're not just handymen but it's also something that people are doing at a very high level you can be a professional tile setter and it's you know as far as I care, you might as well be a wizard, right? Because I, I highly respect what you're doing. And I see these beautiful things. And I thought, well, this is something I can excel at. I need, and that's what I needed in my life that at that point was I needed to find something that I could be passionate about being good at. Right. And I'm pr pretty good at it now. And I'm, you know, just going to continue to get better. Um, yeah. So the boy, so Facebook tile geeks, uh, 
it opened my eyes and it really changed things. And now, you know, folks like you that have this passion for the business side, which is, is greatly lacking in most of a uh, young tile guy like me, you know, our, our lives are not necessarily centered around business. We don't have training in that. I have a, a my a bachelor's degree, I have a minor in business. Okay. But it's all, it's, I haven't seen the transfer to real life until recently where like the, the accountant asked for my balance sheet and I'm like, what's that? Like they told me about that in college, but I've never seen one in real life, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's a great thing what you're doing, getting, uh, getting us all to share our stories and our, our common failures and find out what's working for guys and what we can all be doing to improve. Yeah. You know? With, and it doesn't have to be at the expense of anyone. That's the beautiful thing. You right. Know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Thank you. Um, and thank you for sharing your story. That was uh, quite a story. It sounds, it sounds like Tile really gave you a new outlook on life and um, kind of saved you in, in, a, in a lot of ways there during that rough period in your life. It gave me a lot of purpose, man. Uh, I, <clears throat> up, up to that point in my life, I had not really planned to be a family person. And so uh, meeting my wife, you know, around the time I met my wife, I went to college to get a degree thinking that, you know, I would go on and wear a suit doing something. And over the course of wasting 40 grand and four years of college, I found out that I don't like to wear a suit very much. <laughs> so that, that was a four year mistake, not necessarily a mistake, but um, yeah, An I have a degree and it isn't in tile and I'm still paying for it. So yeah, that's what that is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of um, other things, you know, there's a saying vision is 20 or, <clears throat> when you look 2020 vision, when you're looking hindsight. back on your life, hindsight there. Thank you. Hindsight is 2020. <laughs> what are some other things uh, as you grew your tile business over the last four or five years, what are some things you wish you could have done different or you could, you could tell the younger guy who's maybe this is his first month in business or whatever. <laughs> well, when I went out on my own in business, um, I had been working for uh, various local stores, you know, tile stores, and I didn't have, any capacity for planning. Um, I didn't have any capacity for um, like a place to stock materials and things like that. Um, I was greatly deficient in everything I needed to run a business except being a tile setter. And yeah. I really wish that I had maybe waited a little bit or um, made the commitment to go out on my own sooner and made, you know, learn some of these things earlier. But uh, for a guy looking to go out on his own, the first thing I would say is, man, especially if you have a family and you, you don't want to be couch city with your homies, then you need to have 60 days of, of budget for your family set aside um, to weather because you're, it's not necessarily that the money won't be there. I mean, I've, I've worked with very, very little downtime from the moment I opened doors as a business. I've just pretty much been slammed, yeah. but I made making a transition from being an hourly employee to uh, you'll get paid when the builder writes a check type of employee um, was a huge stretch for my family. And, you know, we ate some top ramen kind of stuff, you know, that, yeah. so having the wherewithal to, to ride that out, it, um, would have made a big difference to my, probably to my family too. And, you know, when you're starting a business, your family is developing attitudes about your business. And so that might've, you know, helped foster some healthier opinions of how things were going. That's a good point. It had not been so rough on my family. So, yeah. That, that's one thing um, that, that would make a big and, and if you don't have that, if you, if you say, well, where am I going to get, you know, $5,000 or whatever it costs to run your household for two months. Yeah. If you're not out on your own and you're not out doing side work and working nights and weekends uh, to make that money and set it aside, then you need to start work extra hours because when you own your own business, you're going to be working those extra hours and you need to be ready for it. And you need to have your mind right about not thinking this sucks or whatever, you know, you need to plan for that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there were some times that things were going kind of badly for me. And I just realized that I was looking around at other more successful people. They were just working harder than me, man. <laughs> I was slacking. Yeah. <laughs> I caught myself slipping. And so I have, have made this commitment with my wife that, Aside from occasional, you know, something goes wrong. Sometimes we have to honor our commitments and work extra hours. But I currently am on a 5-10 schedule. We work 5-10s. Uh, I'm home by dinner every night. Um, my standard, and this is was super important to me when, um, when I first 
started out controlling paperwork. And now at first, there's not a ton of paperwork. You don't have, you know, uh, balance right. sheets, for instance. Right. I still don't have one of those, but um, you don't have a ton of paperwork beyond bids and maybe right. some some ordering. But then I, I was finding that it was my habit to do the bids like Friday night or uh, Saturday, you know, a, a really inconvenient time. And by the time it rolled around, making mistakes because I was you know, maybe because it'd be done, I didn't, hey. I just don't want to do it, or you know, hey, so I wasn't doing the best job that I could with it. Yeah, I, I lost you there for a second. Can you repeat that? Um, sorry, I, I uh, my uh, I, I got a phone call. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> it must have been that. Um, so yeah, I found that I was doing my paperwork at a just a, an inopportune time. I was doing it on Friday night when I was tired or had had a couple beers and it was just not working well for me. <laughs> I was starting to dread the only paperwork I had to do, you know, it's like what's two or three hours a week, maybe at that point to get bids, to look at paperwork and get planning done. And I was just not doing it very well because I was just doing it at the wrong time. Right. Don't do that when you're at home with your kids going daddy, daddy, because then you got to be a bad father and just be like, go away kid or you know what I mean or yeah. you're not going to do as good a job because you're not paying attention so it is I've changed my custom and now in that 510 schedule at least three days a week I stop at 11 15 and I do paperwork for an hour and a half it's the middle of the day I'm in like full tile guy mode I'm hitting all of the things that I'm thinking about I'm you know just walked out of a job site on my knees where I would have all these details to think about so it's all fresher and then when you know you have this sense of accomplishment, you're like, wow, I feel good about that. I got something done. You're starting the second half of your day with that feeling of accomplishment, and then you're going home and you're not doing paperwork at home. Nice. And so it's just a win-win thing. Um, yeah, I've only had a couple homeowners be like, well, you just go sit in your truck for an hour and a half in the middle of the work day. What, what the hell are you doing out there? <laughs> and I tell them, well, I'm talking to Luke Miller on tile money, you know? Right. That's what I'm... <laughs> but yeah, so the make room for that paperwork um anything that is going to be a stressor for you right as far as running your business you need to make time to address that when you are not stressed out already or super duper tired from the end of the day you're not going to be at your best you know most yeah. of us function pretty well under pressure it kind of goes with the whole tile guy thing but you just want to be at 100 percent you know mentally when you start making decisions that are going to affect the future of your business so nice. that has made a huge difference for me i'm i'm happy nothing else has changed i'm just, i haven't started making more money necessarily although i make less mistakes i make more money right but right um i just feel better about the same amount of work getting done in the same amount of time just by virtue of when in my schedule that work is placed so that's yeah. been a big thing for me nice yeah, that's a great, those are two great tips. Be, um, be financially, you know, stable and able to, you know, kind of save for a couple months, work hard nights and weekends even um, before you go out on your own because chances are you're going to do that a little bit anyways. It's good training. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good tile guy. Training. Yeah. If you don't like that, then maybe you should continue just a 40 hour nine to five. Exactly. And it'll give you the appreciation for what your boss does. You know, a lot of guys that are going out on their own before they're ready. I've seen several guys do it and watch them crash. And um, the, the general drive behind that, you know, obviously everyone wants to make more money, but there's like this underlying feeling that somehow this other person is making more than they deserve off of my labor. Yeah. So go do what that guy does, you know, part time. Right. Trying to trying to get go towards starting a business and see if it feels like all of a sudden that guy is not really doing anything to make the money that he's making off of your labor. Yeah. You know? Exactly. So, yeah. So empathy. Yeah. That's great. Great advice there. Um, besides Tile Geeks and and some of the other forums online, do you do any industry events or anything like that? Yeah. Well, I'm in training for the CTEF to be an evaluator. I've been to several of their events with, uh, with McD and, nice. uh, and a couple other guys. And, and, uh, so I'm a CTI and I'm, I'm involved. I'm a member of the NTCA. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm passionate about tile. You put me in a room with two tile guys and we won't shut up about tile. My <laughs> wife calls it tile con. I go to McDaniel's house in Portland for, you know, I got a, a something to do with, <laughs> the next morning got to get up early so i stay there or whatever and 
we just stay up all night and talk about tile, man. It's like <laughs> summer camp for tile guys. Um, so yeah, I, I love being involved and I really love uh, finding common ground with young people mm-hmm. that are interested in, in, in tile, especially, but um, you see folks realizing young folks realizing that, wow, I, that guy's driving a nice truck. You know, uh, that guy's, you know, taking his family to Red Lobster. And of course, we don't want to be shallow, but we want to have nice things. We want to have nice things for our family. So seeing uh, people, young people engage and, and see that, wow, this, this is something that can be a, a career for me. This is not just a, I'm going to be a helper and grout for a guy on weekends, but for projecting it as a, a, a legit career in the trades. Mike Pro, you know, is doing big strides towards that too. Um, so yeah. I'm actually involved with the joint apprenticeship, joint apprenticeship trade commission or committee or what I don't know what it is, but it's the the tile trade apprentice program in Portland, Oregon right now. Dirk Sullivan and Sean Parker and yep. Ryan Willoughby and uh, lots of folks from uh, the Portland area um, have worked hard to transform that into something that is really helping local companies. So I'm in, I'm have a meeting with them Friday. I'll be going up there and I uh, taught a class. You know earlier this month on with the, the Schluter rep on underlayment and I just love it you know at, at first you think what am I gonna you're gonna put me in front of 12 20 year old people and expect yeah. me to, to entertain them for eight hours and like keep them busy and I just found out very quickly that we are all interested in tile and I mean I had the time of my life man I was like at the dry erase board showing them about car decking none of them had ever seen car decking because they all work for general contractors that take care of that crap before they get there right they were like no that's not a thing I'm like that's a thing almost every remodel you go on there was car decking there at one point (laughs) if you have not seen it and had to tear it out and reframe you're very fortunate that you work for good generals you know but um yeah it's great and it's uh it's the type of thing, like I said, it doesn't have to cost anybody anything. We can give of ourselves and it, it feels good to be contributing. And uh, yeah, so I think education is the future of the business, just like you are educating folks about the, the money end of things, which I, I need a lot of help in that area myself, obviously. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good thing. Well, that's incredible. I appreciate, um, I appreciate everything you're doing in the industry. That's, that's a lot. It's, uh, you're, but what you're doing is you're putting your roots down and, you know, I, I firmly believe you're going to, you're going to, I'm, I'm excited to watch your business grow and I'm looking forward to the future for you. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. You know, honestly, when, it, when Dirk uh, first mentioned it to me, <laughs> Eric had been with me for about a year and a half. I think when it first started, you know, the rumblings of we're going to, you know, ixnay the folks that are wrecking this apprenticeship program, it was a whole, you know, dirty past or whatever the previous, um, administration had done and we're just going to cut it off and reinvent it start again from scratch and i was like well great i have an apprentice that i can put in this let's do it man Um, i'm all for that you know because it'll benefit me and make my business better yeah Uh, and i think that that was just you know the lord's vehicle for putting me in a place where i could be of service really and and i found out as time progressed that Eric will be gone by the time the thing is running enough for you to put an apprentice in the program. So, uh, you know, I could have taken it as just wasted time, but I, I'm just enthusiastic about it. And it is kind of its own reward to just be involved with that sort of thing. So yeah. I'm, I'm stoked to be involved with that and see how it's progressing. I mean, at the moment, everyone that has an apprentice in there, all of the apprentices are um, found by contractors and they're brought to the program and say, okay, we have this kid that we hired. He knows how to grout now teach them you know basic fundamentals of tile yeah and the hope is that over time that will organically grow into something that's just generating enough interest that someone will come with the interest to the apprenticeship program and then the apprenticeship program instead of training people that are already placed will be like great here classes start now and we'll help you get placed with a contractor because we right. know there are lots of contractors that need it so that's the long-term goal is to um, to create excellent installers and um, to to bring people in from outside of this kind of. I mean, you know, tile, like most trades, I assume is is pretty insular. Uh, when before social media, especially, we would go to the tile shop and there would be other tile guys there, and I'd be like, "Who are those guys? I don't know those guys. Are those guys doing a good job? I don't know because I ain't talking to them, right?" It, 
this weird thing where right. we look at each other from under the brims of our hats, you know. Yeah. Um, and social media has just blown the doors off of that. Now I'm friends with almost all the installers in my area that I'm aware of. We're all buddies. We go to Buffalo Wild Wings on Thursdays sometimes. You know, it's it's good times, and it's a uh, it's a, just another thing where we've learned that excellence in your business doesn't have to cost anybody else anything. You can do a fantastic job and everyone benefits from it. The market is, is killing it right now. Um, it's slowing down, people are telling me, but my business is not slowing down. So it guts me to have to go and repair, well, I won't repair somebody else's failing work. It's a gut and replace. If the market will bear more work right now, there's more work than we could all get to. Right. We could all make a tile army and we can't get all the work done. Right, so for somebody out there to be doing crappy work that has to be repaired, it's a draw. It's a draw on the market. It's dragging the market itself down. But then it's unnecessary, man. We can take that same guy, and some guys would be like, "Run that son of a out of town," you know. Get rid of that guy, you know. Make it what yeah. make him go two towns over and install failures over there. That doesn't make any sense. Right. You can reach that guy where he's at and say, "Check it out, man. You can do a better job, and you can get paid a lot more for doing that better job." There are lots of people. The people are standing in line to pay for you to do that better job. So come over here. We will help you, man. We will equip you in any way that is necessary to help you to be the guy that can do that better job. And now we're all benefiting it. Yeah. The child doesn't have a black eye. You, I was. I went to a job yesterday. I very rarely do homeowners, but it was a referral from my plumber. He says, wait here. And he runs upstairs and he turns on the shower and water starts pouring out of the can wow. underneath the shower. I don't know why I felt it was necessary to demonstrate it to me, but it's just like, there's no need for that. It, yeah. it doesn't ever have to happen. And if it, if all of the under the table guys around here got registered and licensed, I'm in a state that requires licensing for tile guys and went out and did, we're doing the same jobs and just making more, putting more money into the local economy. There's no downside to that. I mean, none at all. So yeah, I'm all for it. You know, um, now I see a now I see a guy. We, we were on vacation. I saw a guy with the Ardex sticker on his truck, and I ran up, said, "Hey, dude, I'm a tile guy." And he was like, "What is up with you, man? I'm a tile guy up in my face." And so he's that still that guy at the at the tile shop. Like, Who's that guy? Don't know that guy. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, I gave him a business card, but he didn't call me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, was... <laughs> uh, I gave him yeah. a UPP sticker too, but I bet he didn't put it on his truck. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that that old mindset is is dying off slowly, but um, I'm I'm glad to see it. I'm glad to see it going bye bye. <laughs> yeah, wow. it's it's just not necessary. We, you know, the part of me not knowing about industry standards when I was getting started was that insular thing. We don't talk to other tile guys much, and you know, um, the you know now and, and from a, and from a business perspective too, it's it's only harmed the business side of things because I, I think the old mindset that our fathers and their fathers had was I'm not going to share, like, I'm not going to share it with Robert, my numbers. Why do I, why do I care? Robert's in Oregon. He's in a different state. Why do I care? I I'll give you my numbers. It might not work for your business, but even, even the local guys, let's say I share a guy three blocks down from me, my numbers. The only thing it's going to do is he's going to say, Oh, Luke, you're, I'm, I'm more than you. And then I'm going to say, wow, I need to raise my prices or he's going to exactly. say, or he's going to say, wow, I should raise my prices if Luke's commanding this much. And, yeah. and it's, it's going to form unity in the business. Um, and it's not that, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, price union, fixing. Yeah. Price fixing or union type stuff, but I'm just talking about in general, you know, can you afford to live, you know, in general, for instance, if you call an electrician or a plumber, you know, pretty much probably within 10% what you're going to pay them per hour. Right. If you call another tile guy, you know, that you don't know, you, you have no clue their day charge or their hourly charge. It's just not, it's just not known. It's not talked about. So when, and, when a young guy goes out on his own, he has no clue what he's worth, what his value is. And it's very easy to get demoralized at that point and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm charging 25. I was making 18 bucks an hour and now I'm charging 30 bucks an hour and it ain't enough. Nobody's right. going to pay me more than, and you just, I mean, you just need somebody to reach out their hand and, and help and help you along. And the, yeah. the previous mindset that these folks are going to somehow come along and take work that you would be doing otherwise. I mean, that may be true in certain, you know, 
market conditions, but it's certainly not true now. Not true. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there, there's no doing away with that fear is very helpful too. just say, hey, we can all just work 60, 80 hours a week if we want to. There's no reason to not be pretty open about what we're making. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. I like yeah. it. Well, uh, I know you had a funny story I wanted you to share before we wrap <laughs> this up. <laughs> well, I tell you, um, I've not always been the best at keeping track of paperwork. Um, I prefer that my builders give me, you know, plans and then I doodle on them as part of, and then I keep the plans and that's part, that's my file. It's like a set of plans folded in half. That's my file, you know. Um, but a lot of my builders have, have made a switch to where that request for bid is uh, electronic everything you know so I do all my bids on the iPad now um, and with that is addresses <laughs> and uh, so I'm kind of learning how things are going uh, this day I picked up you know, 300 square feet of tile 150 for the floor and 150 for this big shower and I drove to a job site and the there was a you know a sign out there from the plumber and I thought oh this is the place and I, I backed up the plumber was up there doing his thing and uh, I packed all this tile up the stairs. I don't know how many trips it was, but like, you know, probably 40, 45 trips up the stairs. And at the end of it, I was pretty gassed and up the stairs come the wrong builder. And I was, I was in the wrong house. I had just packed all that stupid tile up the stairs in the wrong house. And the correct house was three. The number was like, you know, two, five, seven instead of two, five, four or whatever. It was like across the street. So I had to haul all that tile downstairs, pack it into my van, drive across the street and pack it all back upstairs. Uh, and that, I didn't make any money that day. Oh. Uh, not a penny. <laughs> I bagged it at the end of the, when I got all the tile up the second flight of stairs, I was like, yep, I'm done. I just went home. <laughs> and uh, so I was, see that. I was the only other there. really funny thing that has happened to me, uh, I was uh, doing a backslash for one of the local file firefighters. He's a really good guy and uh, they had, had his father who had dementia living with them while I built their shower and tiled their bathroom. They had me back to do a backsplash. And when I walked in, the old guy who was always sitting in the chair there, he's no longer there. His chair's still there. And I was like, where is Ed? And they said, well, we just put Ed in the nursing home yesterday. Um, so I was like, oh, well, that's a trip. And I'm working and I'm laying out and I'm protecting the countertops and the phone rings. And the homeowner comes walking in, answers the phone, and her face just crumples. And her father, Ed, had died that morning at the nursing home oh. and so um so of course you know she grabs me and hugs me she's crying it's just a big mess um and I'm, I'm like i need to get out of here man this is this is going to get dark <laughs> and i told her you know I'll, don't worry about it i'll pack up my stuff i'll bail and she's like no everyone we know is coming here you have to finish today so <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yeah man how mercenary can you get right but you know it's practical too so yeah uh, so i tiled this backsplash for this family that i've known for years while they planned my friend ed's funeral at the kitchen table man <laughs> it was a it was a funky day people that i had never seen before probably never see again were coming up and hugging me and telling me stories about ed anyways that's that's probably my most memorable day on the yeah i'd say so i'd say so that's a strange day <laughs> <laughs> yeah that probably won't happen again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you you might be the only person that that happened to. <laughs> <laughs> there, I, there was a thread on on the forums about guys finding dead bodies on job sites. Mm. Weird, weird things happen. It's For life. Sure. For life, sure. life happens everywhere. You know. Yeah, and that's and that's uh, why I, I like to ask that question from time to time. Is uh, strange things do happen when you're in. an you know, 20 houses, 30 houses a year, <laughs> strangers. Yeah. That's one of the things I like about tile actually is um, some people are jerks and you just don't talk to them very much. But in general, folks in their home with a tradesperson that they have a good rapport with, you get to learn about folks in a way that you probably would never, you know, even if you went to school with them or church or whatever, but didn't spend three weeks in their bathroom watching them make tea on a hot plate in the laundry room you know watching them do their dishes in the bathtub all that kind of stuff um you just learn a lot about who people really are and what drives them and, for and sure. that's that's new on almost every job for me and uh, so i like people so it's, yeah it's a good thing for me so yeah that's what i've enjoyed too a, a local plumber here in my area he said he told me a story once he said i was I, I think it was a judge he was doing some plumbing for a local judge 
And he said, man, your job must be so cool. You know, you've got this degree and, you know, oh man, you get to see so many people and do. And the judge said, oh man, I envy you. He said, you're, you're tied into the community in ways that I'll never be. Maybe it wasn't a judge. I don't know what it was, but it was some, some type. He's like, you're, you're so close knit with your community. He's like, you're in their personal space in their homes every day. And so that's, that's kind of a, a good way to look at it. Just like you just said. So. Well, Robert, thank you for um, taking the time. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. I enjoyed speaking with you, and I hope everybody has a great day too, man. Appreciate it. All right. Here's looking forward to 2019. Right on. It's going to be a good year for all of us. For sure. For sure. All right. All right, Robert. Take care. Take care.